please, this way. So first, I have to thank Rob. Um, we uh, have done work together in the past, and now that I'm in the government, I appreciate the work that Rob does even more than I did before. The um, power of convening is sometimes underestimated, and this is the power of ideas. Um, I think Rob brings both to bear with this formidable intellect, relationship, and perspective on policymaking. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here um, on such an important topic. And for those who uh, haven't been following, um, I will start by uh, articulating a little bit about the President's Spectrum Initiative, which I've had the pleasure of working on. Uh, I would particularly recommend for folks Larry Summers' speech he gave at the New America Foundation. I think I see uh, Michael Calabrese here somewhere, um, was a very gracious host. The, importance of Larry's speech was he was able to put into context why this matters and the broad context, and it's something which I would put, put in the smart policy framework that Rob said, it's public action catalyzing private investment. And what Larry Summers talked about is the role of the Intercontinental Railroad, something Abraham Lincoln helped facilitate during the Civil War, the role of land-grant colleges, which helped drive the agriculture revolution, both came about because of thoughtful public <coughs> policy that facilitated and saw the importance of private investment. That's true in the wireless space as well. If you look back over the last 40 years, what has happened in wireless is nothing short of extraordinary. It was 1980-something when some unnamed McKinsey consultants looked at this business and said, maybe by 2000 you could get one million people using wireless devices. Um, and based on that conventionalism at the time, at t was willing to say, um, well, we don't care so much about these wireless lights, we'll just let the bells happen. Literally at the press conference, when I think it was Charlie Brown was the uh, CEO of at t was asked, what's gonna happen to the wireless business? He didn't particularly know or at the time care. So, you know, not that long ago, wireless was an afterthought. Today, at t reconstitute at t refers to themselves as first and foremost as a wireless company. And what is exciting, among other things, is not just consumers using mobile devices, and we passed, I think now five years ago, when more consumers have mobile phones than fixed line phones, but also machine to machine communications. All of this is leading to what the FCC and others have called a spectrum crunch. And the administration has taken notice of this and has set out a policy initiative for us to address it it's gonna require a lot of creative thinking, hard work, and it's taking up a lot, most of my time, to think about both how do we enable private sector licensees who have limited purpose licenses, who might be willing to exchange really in a win-win deal, uh, participating in this incentive auction. How do we get government users of Spectrum who might not be using Spectrum in the most efficient manner to use Spectrum more efficiently? And how do we drive innovation about how we use Spectrum uh, in unlicensed ways, in increased sharing ways, in interference mitigation techniques, all of which are gonna become increasingly necessary in a world where we can't just say, well, we have this open swap of spectrum here, we'll just give it to someone to do their new service. Um, that is not a luxury we have anymore, and so we have to be more thoughtful and uh, a lot more focused on using new tools to manage our spectrum more efficiently. So the title of this SMART policy is certainly what we're aspiring to do in this initiative, and I look forward to a discussion, people's thoughts, and your all questions. Great, thanks, Joel. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna give the economist perspectives on what want to do uh, on these policy uh, discussions, and uh, the, our perspective on the mobile broadband uh, marketplace and future. And as a background, as an economist, when we look at a policy uh, question, uh, there's sort of two rules of thumb we use. Um, one is that, uh, and this is as true for uh, spectrum reallocations as anything else, is that the benefits of the policy should outweigh the costs of the policy. And the second is uh, rule of thumb is that we probably shouldn't get involved unless there's a market, that there's some failure in a market that needs to be corrected. Footnote C, uh, the first policy rule. So um, this is quite true in spectrum. Um, as Phil said, it's all, somebody has a claim to all of it, and the question in reallocating is, is the new use worth more than the old use? Um, and I'll give uh, one example um, of the broadcast spectrum. There's about 300 megahertz dedicated to broadcasting right now. If that spectrum was reallocated to mobile broadband, it'd be worth 
um, in the neighborhood of $60 billion. And um, it would cost the broadcasters either sort of in out-of-pocket payments or lost financial value, $9, $12 billion somewhere around there if they lost access to their spectrum. So clearly the benefits of reallocating that to wireless broadband far outweigh the costs, the economic costs of doing it. And I recognize that we need to uh, share some of those benefits with the broadcasters as an inducement. Um, but more generally, uh, the broadband plan and, uh, and other uh, estimates put out there suggest we need something like 500 to 800 megahertz of spectrum. And although I would, I'm not going to come out and say there's an exact number we need, the, the economist's perspective is that we should reallocate spectrum up into the point where the next megahertz we reallocate would cost more to reallocate than the benefits of it. And eight, five to 800 megahertz of spectrum would be worth about $100 billion, very roughly, um, if it was sold today. That's taking into account almost having the value of spectrum because you're flooding the market. Um, and the point I want to make about that is $100 billion pays for an awful lot of real reallocations. Uh, even if you gave half of that money to the broadcasters and that got you half the spectrum, you still have $50 billion for other things. And that reallocates an awful lot of radar systems uh, and uh, communication systems in the government sector and in uh, other private uses. Um, $100 billion of this spectrum would have a, a, a big footprint on the economy. Um, Again, these are sort of very rough numbers, but the amount of economic activity that would justify paying $100 billion for a spectrum would support uh, over 100,000 direct jobs, permanent direct jobs uh, in the broadband sector, and over um, half a million jobs, sort of economy wide, as the spending uh, works its way through the economy. Um, and, and finally, the benefits to consumers from this additional spectrum, additional activity in the broadband sector, again, at a very high level is really quite astounding. The, the rule of thumb that we have seen in, uh, over the years is that the value uh, to consumers, the consumer surplus, what they value their wireless services above what they pay for them. Um, that, that consumer surplus is on the order of 10 to 20 times what the spectrum is worth itself. So if you have a hundred million, uh, excuse me, hundred billion dollars worth of spectrum, um, you're talking about trillion, two trillion dollars in value to consumers that would be created when that spectrum is developed, deployed, and, and brought to market. Uh, and that's uh, clearly um, worth a lot of policy effort. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, Robin, and thanks for inviting AT&T to participate in this forum. I'm thrilled to talk about the wireless broadband revolution, and make no doubt about it, it's a revolution. We at AT&T feel like we've had a front seat to that revolution and certainly have been surprised uh, at where it's come to date and I think we'll continue to be surprised on where it's going because we really haven't seen anything yet. I mean, I think as some of the panelists talked about earlier, it was not that long ago when our wireless net network was very voice-centric. Uh, we did offer some data services, texting and whatnot, but they were largely ancillary to the primary product of our network, which was voice services. Of course, BlackBerry revolutionized that when they introduced the email. Uh, mobility and email was combined, and we thought that was great, but again, we hadn't seen anything. It was June 2007 when Apple introduced the iPhone, and I think that really changed the world, and it's been changing ever since. Uh, data usage on our network has been exploding. I think you've all seen the forecasts. I personally think those forecasts are probably conservative, because every forecast that we've tried to do on data usage on our network has turned out, in hindsight, to be conservative. So what's driving that? Uh, it's not only smartphone penetration. Our customer base is currently at about 50% in terms of its smartphone penetration. That's going to continue to grow, but that's not it. It's also the portable device market is exploding, and I'm talking about the e-tablets uh, and the e-books and the navigation devices and all the other devices that our, our customers are now carrying around with them for their personal productivity and personal communication. Per unit sales of wirelessly enabled portable devices is expected to grow from approximately 6 million in 2008 to 86 million in 2014. This area is exploding. We've also talked a little bit about machine to machine. Some of the prior panelists talked about how important those new devices are to their business models. That is exploding as well. 
AT&T has stood up in Austin, Texas, an emerging devices lab. The sole uh, responsibility for that lab is to certify new machine-to-machine -machine devices that rely on wireless connectivity and work with new partners to bring those devices to market. Last year, AT&T <coughs> certified over 1,000 devices in that space. And again, we haven't scratched the surface. Now, also at the heart of this revolution, in my opinion, is the application. And as our CTO, John Donovan, likes to say, APIs are the new IP. On a wireless device, it's not necessarily about the browser anymore. It's about the application. Uh, 250,000 applications available on the Apple uh, platform and many other platforms, of course, emerging and expanding all the time. U.S. is the leader in apps growth right now with over 1 billion downloads in 2009. A billion application downloads. Applications really are changing the way we use our devices and the way we slice information and access information and are productive in our personal lives. We we've heard about the banking applications, which I think is going to change. It's already changing and will continue to change the way we have relationships with our financial institutions. We heard about health uh, from the MedApps representative, and that is an amazing and exploding area as well. Now, this, it's not only consumer-centric, it's also enterprise. Enterprise customers are increasingly getting into the application space. And by that, I mean uh, not, uh, not enterprises like Bank of America offering applications to their consumers, but introducing applications into their workforce to drive their own productivity. Mobile applications in the enterprise space drove approximately 150 terabits a month of data on our network in 2009. By 2014, that's forecasted to be about 16,000 terabits. So again, explosive use of wireless data network in that space. When we look at it, the very ways in which we are communicating with each other are changing. We have moved to a talk to me mode of communication very much to a show me model of communication. Video is quickly becoming king on our network. And it's not just YouTube applications. Uh, what we're seeing now with AT&T's telepresence is more and more enterprises are using a telepresence to bring uh, that type of productivity to their businesses. It means you don't have to get on a plane uh, AT&T's monthly telepresence volume was less than six terabits a month last June. By this May, that's going to grow about tenfold. And we're seeing that, of course, move into the consumer space as well with the video share applications we're seeing on mobile devices. Before long, video and video communication will be a significant part of how we communicate with each other. Now, mobility, we think, really has been a catalyst for a lot of this revolution and for a lot of this increased productivity. But it's also, at the end of the day, the characteristic that I believe is most likely to create the biggest challenges and the biggest limitations on our ability to meet this new demand. Capacity constraints on wireless networks are very real. And the, they're very different in terms of managing a wireless network than how you would manage a wireline network. I think to get to the heart of it, you have to think about the core transmission uh, facility on a wireless network versus a wireline network. Of course, with wireline networks, we can look to fiber. Fiber has enormous capacity. Theoretical transmission speeds over a single fiber can reach as high as 25 million megabits per second. Compare that to the primary transmission uh, facility for wireless, which of course is Spectrum, something we're talking a lot about in DC these days. Theoretical top speed for an LTE carrier, and that's a 4G carrier that's being deployed now and we'll, we will be deploying over the next year or so on our networks is 100 megabits a second. And that's theoretical. Actual top speeds, I think, as Rob indicated, is probably closer to 10 or 15 megabits in terms of practical use. So you can see the challenges that we are going to face on the wireless side in terms of demand, uh, meeting all these demands and handling all the data that's traveling uh, our network and is going to continue to grow. Now, what are we doing at AT&T to try to meet this increased demand? Uh, particularly given the fact that the amount of spectrum available in any market, and certainly the amount of spectrum available in our portfolio is very finite, there's a number of things that we are doing. Number one, we increasingly are investing in network efficiencies, uh, investing billions of dollars to upgrade our network, first to HSPA+, Plus, which is basically a software upgrade for our 3G network to drive greater efficiency and greater throughput. And finally, of course, we're heading as quickly as we can to our 4G LTE deployment, uh, which will also increase capacity on our network and our throughput capabilities. 
we are spending a lot of our CapEx trying to capitalize on complementary technologies. And by that, I'm talking about Wi-Fi hotspots, as well as microcells, uh, Wi-Fi, which of course is our, is our way we use unlicensed spectrum in our portfolio. We have 20,000 Wi-Fi hotspots in the country, the biggest Wi-Fi footprint out there, and we are now moving to the deployment of what we're calling Wi-Fi hot zones. Times Square is now a Wi-Fi hot zone. Wrigley Field is now a Wi-Fi hot zone. So if you're an AT&T customer and you're anywhere within that zone, you can use the Wi-Fi capability on your device to connect to our data network. 95% of the devices in our portfolio are Wi-Fi capable. So this is a very important part of our uh, strategy to handle the data demand, and we want to work to make sure that the Wi-Fi clients in these devices are smart, and they actively can go and, and seek that uh, capacity when it's available. And of course, we're deploying more cell sites and adding a capability to our backhaul as well. Uh, in the first half of this year, we added 600 new cell sites. We upgraded over 900 cell sites to 3G capabilities. We deployed more than 6,000 additional radio carriers at our existing cell sites and 32 distributed antenna systems. Again, <coughs> trying to drive more capacity. But at the end of the day, and this is why we are so supportive of all the work that Phil is doing in the administration, that the FCC did in its national broadband plan, at the end of the day, we need more spectrum. This industry needs more spectrum. And I think the, uh, I have called the national broadband plan on this issue visionary because we need to start working on these issues now if we are going to have spectrum identified and reallocated for commercial use in the future. We cannot wait until we are in a crisis situation before we start addressing and trying to resolve the difficult spectrum issues. And um, also I think as the panel has indicated and made clear, I think that this broadband, uh, wireless broadband data ecosystem is only at its infancy. And we need to work together as this ecosystem grows and it has to mature to the benefit of all participants. And that's not only just the network providers, but that's our partners who are, are developing applications, our partners who are developing devices, uh, our partners that are developing chipsets, and most importantly, our consumers. Because it's really what they're demanding, which is driving all the activity in this space. And we think that the market needs to be able to explore new models of doing business with great flexibility and without unnecessary regulatory uh, intervention. Certainly the wireless industry has succeeded to date with a model of very light touch regulatory, uh, a, a light touch regulatory approach. And uh, we believe that that's the right approach as we move forward with complicated issues here. And uh, we will continue, of course, to work with, with everybody uh, to ensure that we're all able to capitalize on this revolution and move it forward. Thank you. Great. Dean? I could start by saying I just completely agree with what everyone's said before me and just leave it right there. But let me add just a, a couple thoughts. Uh, in the, in, first of all, this is a very unique uh, debate in Washington, this spectrum debate. Uh, it's unique for at least three reasons that I can think of. First of all, as Senator Warner said, this is a completely bipartisan issue. There is not a uh, there, there is not a Republican way of looking at the need for more spectrum or a Democratic way for looking at more spectrum. This is something that really is bipartisan. Um, I know of no, the FCC's National Broadband Plan, which was a fabulous document. I, I didn't see people picketing in the street about that because it was too liberal, too conservative, or whatever. So I think in the first, in the first place, we should all be optimistic. This is the kind of issue, even in an election year, uh, while there are debates about tax policy, while there are debates about uh, social issues, this is one that you know is right down the middle, everyone can agree on. The second reason why it's unique is, as we heard from the second panel, is this mobile broadband area is the sweet spot of the American economy. We're not talking about uh, steel production, we're not talking about a dying industry. This is what every uh, CEO wants to be a part of, a vibrant, growing industry. I read the press releases every day from Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, the other carriers, and, I, and then the device manufacturers and the application providers, and literally, it is a full-time job just to keep up on who's making investments where, what new devices are coming to market, what new applications. It is just an unbelievably dynamic, uh, um, um, marketplace and probably the prior panel we had, which Phil, I hope you have a chance to view online, was a wonderful demonstration of 
transformative new business models in areas ranging from uh, uh, health, banking, uh, the zip car, um, uh, smart grid. Uh, we can have that panel once a month and we can have completely different industries. We haven't even scratched the surface. And of course the third reason why this is so different than most Washington policy debates is you know, this is not, this is the opposite of a bailout, right? AT&T is not saying please federal government bail me out, buy something, buy my troubled asset. No, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, Cricket, the others are saying we want the opportunity to buy an asset from the federal government. Guess what? It's either an asset that the federal government has that's inefficiently used or underused, or it's an asset that other folks have, i.e. broadcasters, satellite companies, whoever, who want the chance to sell, but have no way to sell it to for a mobile broadband application. So all of that goes a long way of saying, I think this passes the common sense test as a policy area that People, uh, liberals, conservatives, moderates can all agree should be addressed and for all the reasons that Joan explained really needs to be addressed quickly. So now let me just turn to three trends that kind of underlie this spectrum crunch. The first trend which Joan did a wonderful job of explaining is you know, demand is exploding. And we, we, all, we don't actually need to come to a panel in Washington to hear someone say that, right? We all know that. We see People are on their iPhone, Blackberry, Android device, whatever, all the time, everywhere we go. Um, what's interesting is that I know of no correlation between smartphone ownership or cell phone ownership and cell phone use and income level. So for example, the Harvard School of Public Health did a study of the folks who left Katrina, during Katrina, New Orleans, and, and ended up at the Astrodome. These are the poorest people in our society. Um, only about 20% of them had a bank account. Uh, over half of them had a cell phone. You know, that, that's just extraordinary. The Pew Foundation does their mobile internet usage study every year, uh, every six months. And every six months they come out with another report that shows that cell phone ownership among African Americans and Hispanics is roughly five, six, seven percent higher than whites. Uh, it shows that um, African Americans and Hispanics um, by something like 20% are more prone to be online using their cell phone to get email or be on the internet. Um, there was a story in the Washington Post about a year ago that showed a homeless guy with the coolest new uh, smartphone. So there really is no correlation to income level. It's truly, this is an area where, again, private investment catalyzed with government action can lift uh, all votes. The second thing that's going on, so that's the demand piece, which is so broad. Then the second piece is, and, and it's, um, it doesn't get a lot of attention, we kind of take it for granted, is the carriers and their uh, technology developers are not just sitting back waiting for the government to give us more spectrum to work with, right? So uh, AT&T is investing something like fill in the blank, 17, 18 billion dollars a year in their network. Verizon is making similar investments. Sprint, T-Mobile, yeah. Cricket, all the rest. So this is an area uh, where there is just an unbelievable level of investment that's going on, irrespective of whether we can solve this spectrum crunch. Because just to meet the short-term needs to get wireless uh, built out, even Today, there are so many areas that, and it's so hard to put a cell site up because of zoning problems and the rest, there's tremendous private investment. And then the third thing that's going on is there's a whole uh, technology development going on in order to bring the cellular base station closer to the device. Because while we're waiting for more spectrum to develop, and while the carriers are upgrading their networks both by building out in areas that they don't cover and adding density in the areas that they do cover and upgrading to faster air interfaces, uh, we need to try and squeeze as much capacity out of the network today in order to meet this incredible crunch. So that means that there are these devices called femtocells, which are the size of a small pizza box, and you're gonna see these femtocells everywhere. And that's gonna take a long time to play out, and it, we think we can squeeze another big capacity gain for the, for the networks from that deployment, and that, that's that gotta happen in parallel. All three of these things 
demand increase, <coughs> upgrading of the networks, and uh, a new network topology. That's all happening um, irrespective, uh, and, and, and it's all happening, and it's not sufficient to solve the spectrum crisis. So for all those reasons, um, you know, we think that we've got to have more spectrum, we've got to have more spectrum quickly. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I want to turn it over to um, comments and questions, but let me just sort of set a little bit of a frame first, because I think um, if you think about the issue of how do we, what are the policy challenges to really help support and drive this mobile revolution, it seems to me there are four big areas. Uh, and we touched on a little bit, on, on the first one a little bit in the, in the first panel, which was really how do we think about in different industry rules and, and regulations? Uh, how do we think about how we regulate the energy sector, which can affect mobile uh, smart grid applications or banking rules? Uh, and who's a bank? Because uh, they're, they're going to be emerging potentially non-bank uh, efforts uh, that are using mobile devices to actually provide banking services. Uh, medical devices, medical regulations, we heard about that this morning. Um, there's a second issue which is really about the core network, and that's, that's a lot of what we've talked about here today, which is how do we ensure a, core, a, a robust core network at the heart of that is really spectrum, but as Dean alluded to, it's other things, issues around cell towers and the recent shot clock decision and how do we enable the infrastructure to get built, but also it's issues around USF, uh, how do we support uh, coverage in areas where there may not be a financial case for it as much right now. A third area would be uh, how the government itself can use these technologies and drive adoption and also how government can support uh, adoption among the general population, issues around, for example, like Lifeline. And then the third is really around regulation and taxes. Uh, we testified last year in, in the House Judiciary on discriminatory taxes and wireless. And the taxes on wireless are actually quite high, particularly in some states like New York. Uh, and the uh, evidence is pretty clear. In fact, from a recent study by Austin Goolsby, it couldn't, couldn't be too recent, but it was, <laughs> it was uh, three or four years ago before he came in the administration, showed that taxes on broadband for every dollar the government raises, there's something like a $3.70 cost in the economy. Um, so I commend you to look at that study. And then, and then lastly, we cannot leave a panel in Washington without talking about the N-word, net neutrality, the NN word. Um, you know, how do we deal with net neutrality? What do we think about it? Uh, and, and, and we haven't talked about that yet. Um, so I know we want to have folks um, uh, have comments or questions. So uh, why don't we, uh, as you're doing that, I want to ask Phil a question though. Um, how do, you know, we heard a lot about the challenges on these networks and the fact that, the, as Joan alluded to, they're different than, than, than the fiber networks who, where you have you know, really, in some ways, much less capacity constraints. How do we think about this? Are, should we be thinking about differences in any kind of net neutrality regime, whether it's voluntary or not, uh, between wireless and wireline? Um, I mean, is there a mic? Is this mic going to work? Uh, no. You know, the FCC is in the middle of doing that, um, and uh, they've just actually asked some more specific questions, so I'm not going to actually comment on that. Um, I'm sure people have to say, but um, it's obviously an issue that's getting a lot of attention. I would just to emphasize your question that the um, majority of the growth in broadband is coming in the wireless sector. So to the extent that there is a difference in effect, it's going to be uh, felt in the uh, wireless area. Well, it's not going to... Uh, you, yeah, there's a button on the, on the bottom. Maybe you can turn that on. Uh, it's probably not going to surprise anyone. Uh, for me to say that I, I am very concerned about the net neutrality debate and how it will impact the wireless networks, the wireless industry. Uh, the FCC did recently issue a public notice in which they sought more input, more comment on two broad areas, and one of them is the question of wireless networks, and are they different, and does it matter? I think that we can all agree that they are fundamentally different in terms of how they operate and the complexities and the challenges that we're going to face, particularly in the onslaught of the data demand that we are seeing on our networks. I think the important policy discussion that we're going to have to continue to have is how does that matter and what is the, pol the appropriate policy result. At the end of the day, we think it has to be about investment. There's an enormous amount of investment required to keep these networks going and to keep improving capacity to meet demand. 
And as Dean said, $18 billion a year. It's AT&T's CapEx for 2009, I believe, was the largest CapEx for any private company in any industry in the country. So we are putting an enormous amount of money into the network to keep up with demand. And I do think that any regulatory uh, policy framework has to understand and not undermine the type of incredible investment that's going to be necessary to keep up with the demand that we're seeing coming. Uh, once again, I agree. Um, I think uh, kudos to the FCC for asking these questions a second time, for being thoughtful, and for gathering input before um, deciding what to do. Um, I think the original FCC NPRM document conceded, uh, as we all know, that wireless networks are different. And of course, the biggest reason why they're different is because they have a capacity constraint, namely, they need license spectrum to operate. And I'm sure. Um, if that weren't the case, uh, it would be a very, it would be you know, a wonderful world. But um, if, uh, if Jones Company wants to add more capacity, they can't just go out and buy another uh, widget and add it to their network. They need to go to the federal government and ask for more spectrum. And right now, there's no more spectrum being auctioned. Um, I also want to say that um, the prior panel, the discussion about these new business models, you know, there was no federal zip card commission. This, Zipcar is developed because of ingenuity, innovation, and the fact that there wasn't a barrier to, uh, uh, to using wireless. Um, and in fact, there were networks, and there are, uh, their ability to operate is unconstrained. And so there should be a great deal of care and thought given before imposing any sort of regime that in any way is going to um, make it more difficult for new business models to come to market in mobile because it is such a vibrant market. Great. If there are questions, if you just want to raise your hand. Um, uh, yes, sir. Right here. Go ahead. I just wanted to measure the uh, general mood of the panel about, as I understand, the Governor Quinlan has passed a law that each citizen has a 700 megabits per second of uh, data entitled to them. I'm not a big fan of entitlement, but I'm just wondering what the general mood is here in this panel. Could we deliver something like that? Is that feasible in the United States? If so, how? This is a pretty, is this 100 megabits device, maybe fiber to every home? I mean, what would, that's a broad statement, 100 megabit over a course of a year? I mean, what's the? I think it, that, that's the question, because it's, it's new, and uh, I think it's actually, if I said it, it's one, so it's one megabit per second. One megabit. So the broadband plan puts out some uh, goals for the U.S. to uh, have as a broadband strategy. Um, I think the one thing I would say uh, in terms of the, the, the rhetoric, uh, rights or entitlements as opposed to goals um, are two different ways to go. I think our way of go goals is probably the better, sounder course because we don't necessarily know how easy it will always be to deliver whatever speed it is across the board. And so if you start getting yourself boxed in that corner, um, you may find yourself doing things that from a cost-benefit analysis perspective don't make a lot of sense. So I would just say we need to be thoughtful and careful as to promising any particular you know, technology or speed because these things are going to evolve over time. And we want to, I think, be a little bit more functionally centric. So um, if we were to try to talk about broadband, um, I think the way that I would encourage talking about, I think the broadband plan is to be nice job of this, is what are the purposes people are using broadband for? To be fully effective citizens, participants in our economy, et cetera. Um, and I think saying that citizens um, need to have access to broadband so they can be you know, engaged participants in our economy and society is the sort of approach we want. Um, how we then translate that into policy, I do think we need to leave some flexibility. This is the uh, universal service question for broadband, right? It's a, it's a modest mega, mega a second. Um, so the economist perspective would uh, cause me to ask, well, what's the problem that's being solved there? So why won't people have uh, this connectivity anyway? Um, and as we know from recent surveys, uh, for people that don't have broadband, less than half of it is because of the cost of it. So there's other reasons out there that, as to why people don't have it. Um, I suspect there's a benefit to me uh, to getting you to sign up to broadband um, if you're existing doing it, haven't done it already. 
Uh, but I'd like to be clear about what that benefit is and try to uh, target any programs that solve those problems um, and definitely avoiding uh, a universal service regime the type we've had in the voice world, uh, replicated in the broadband world. I just want to add, as the National Broadband itself, Plan itself found, 98% of all Americans are covered today by at least one mobile broadband network. Uh, using the old FCC definition of a mobile broadband network, which is a 3G-based network. And I think one of the wonderful parts of the broadband plan, and there's the author, Blair Levin, here today, um, is that it didn't adopt the definition of broadband. You can search all 400 pages and read the, all the footnotes, including the one uh, quoting uh, the Shakespeare play, um, and you won't find a definition of broadband. And I, I think that's great, it sets goals, uh, it sets objectives, but we're not, you know, it's not a command and control approach, and, and I don't, you know, with all due respect to our friends in Finland, I don't think that's the American way. I'll just, I'll just say briefly, I think international comparisons are always interesting, but Finland is not the United States when you think about it from a network perspective and how we're going to deliver broadband to all our citizens. Broadband is important. Uh, the broadband plan did a wonderful job of understanding what is that last incremental percentage of folks who cannot be served. But set aside the adoption issue, which is huge. Broadband's out there, and a lot of folks haven't taken it up. But broadband's not available for the very last percentage of the uh, American citizens, and they tried to dissect why. And it's really about investment and whether there's an economic case for deploying broadband networks out there, and that takes us very quickly to USF. And we fully support uh, uh, um, uh, modifying, uh, reformatting the USF plan to support broadband and, and the FCC has many proceedings underway right now to try to tackle that issue. Good morning. Uh, I already got the part of the answer to my question and I bring again the international perspective because my name is William Ruby and I come from the embassy of Estonia. I don't know how many people here in this room know where Estonia is but it's a small country in northern Europe and our immediate neighbors are Finland and Sweden. Just can uh, add to this that Finland actually made access to the internet a constitutional right. So every person should have access to the internet. But my question is more about prioritizing. And uh, as you know, every country, European Union as well, had its own stimulus to economic crisis. And uh, the European Union didn't have like uh, one big joint stimulus plan. Every national government had, had its own, but still the European Commission, you can compare Euro European Commission like to the federal government here in the United States, had also a small stimulus plan because the Commission's budget is very small, about 1% of EU's uh, GDP. But the Commission chose only two sectors, energy and IT infrastructure. And uh, the European Union is spending billions of euros to uh, building up fiber optics cable network. So also in Estonia, we now launch this, this project so that every household should have access to it in a couple of years time. My question is, do you consider this like outdated, somewhat outdated prioritizing? And you know, it should be more invested to the mobile, mobile uh, broadband? Or do you think that those two branches of the technology are more like partners or complementary, or still very harsh competitors? So this is a very important question, and um, I would say uh, I can answer it several ways. Uh, first is there's always going to be need for wired networks and fiber optic networks because wireless is going to be the last link, but it's going to find its way onto a fiber network sooner or later. And given the increasing demand for spectrum, there's lots of pressure to make that sooner which is why you're trying to get more cell towers, for example, that gets it onto a fiber network sooner. So the need for fiber networks is actually uh, not replaced by more spectrum in mobile communications. In some sense, it's amplified by it because it's getting more traffic on the fiber networks. That's the first answer. The second answer is, in terms of fiber to the home, we have an interesting experiment going on where more mobile broadband providers, uh, so-called 4G, uh, Clearwire is now rolling out here in Washington, Verizon I know is coming up soon, and before long AT&T, are giving people an offering that may satisfy the definition of good enough broadband. 
which means for most people, for many applications, it will give them what they most need. And we will see to what extent people decide they don't want fiber to the home or DOCSIS 3.0, the higher speed cable, and they're gonna go with 4G wireless. We don't know how many people that will apply to, um, so we will see whether uh, it's a substitute for the last sort of long, you know, mile. Um, but I think to your broad question, uh, the two will have to coexist, and we don't know exactly how, but uh, in the main, uh, upgrading sort of backbone infrastructure and uh, backhaul infrastructure is something this country has made a high priority as well, and I, I don't think we'll find many people disagreeing that that's the key part of the equation. Other questions, comments? The administration uh, <coughs> is uh, uh, involved in several meetings over the feedback, which is spectrum is being received by most companies' devices. Um, I'm curious what you hope comes out of that, and, and is there a time frame for when the administration <coughs> would either support or not support the auctioning or reallocating the feedback? So the overall spectrum initiative I outlined uh, was incomplete in my description because there's really a fourth key part. So I mentioned the importance of enabling spectrum held by sort of commercial licensees to have the benefit of incentive auction to enable that to be used to someone else. I mentioned government using spectrum more efficiently and there are tools that would facilitate that as well. Facilitating innovation and more effective uses of the spectrum, uh, sharing, unlicensed uses, opportunistic uses, et cetera. And the fourth one is public safety. Public safety is, in some sense, uh, a beneficiary and an overarching application of many of the points we're talking about. There is an opportunity for a next generation network. This would have public safety benefiting from a nationwide interoperable wireless broadband network. That would have a multitude of benefits. First and foremost, will enable higher levels of interoperability between different first responders and uh, in all likelihood and hopefully second responders as well, electric utilities who often get pulled in the scene of a disaster. It will also enable operability because currently public safety's devices and their networks have much longer development times and investment cycles so they're not benefiting from the state of the art that the devices that AT&T, for example, has on their network. And that is, at some level, an unacceptable state of affairs to say to public safety, you guys aren't gonna have the same quality communications technology that Federal Express and other major American enterprises can have to enable their missions. So this opportunity is a significant public policy challenge. And to um, give your question a little more sort of uh, directness, it's not only about what spectrum needs to be used by public safety, and for that matter, what technologies will enable these networks to work. It's also what type of governance structure will get set up to make this work. As people who are students of this field know, part of the challenge in public safety communications is enabling cooperation across a number of jurisdictions is uh, not easy and requires a lot of thought and care. And then also funding. One thing that this administration has put on the table and made clear, and this is a new development in the world of public safety communications is the first claim of revenues from our spectrum initiative is public safety communications. And this is something where we think by putting actual federal dollars into the system, we can help catalyze the development and the deployment of this next generation network for public safety. How are we going about doing about it? We are holding a series of stakeholder meetings. Different agencies have come together and working in a highly effective fashion, Department of Commerce, Department of Justice, and the Department of Homeland Security to drill down on these different issues I've talked about, come with a thoughtful plan that will be able to inform um, what we see as a unique legislative opportunity. You're already seeing certain bills being talked about now that put these four segments together, um, commercial spectrum uh, opportunities, incentive options, government spectrum, spectrum research and innovation, and finally, public safety. Um, we don't have any timeline on trying to get all this. We really want to take the time to get it right because this is a once in a generation opportunity. As fourth generation wireless services get deployed in the standards bodies by the vendors and um, get developed and we get deployed, 
Um, public safety has the opportunity to benefit from that um, sort of development, and we want to do all we can to facilitate that. Great. One of the uh, underlying issues that drives a lot of the debate in the broadband uh, industry is competition, uh, whether it exists, how much there is, and so forth. And one of the things that seems to me that's changed a lot is how competition happens, in part because of the internet. So take two examples. Applications on mobile phones have really changed dramatically how the mobile market works, and frankly, introduced competition in UAZ for the wireless carrier. Secondly, open is a big model now for a lot of mobile carriers. We have an open development initiative where you can bring in any device, mobile wireless device, test it for five weeks, and they essentially sell it on your own. And some of those who compete with us potentially if people want to bring in devices. Um, I guess what I'm asking, and Phil, you're probably the expert on this, is hasn't competition in the space changed a lot, and has government really kept up with it? It seems to me we're not keeping up with it. There's a lot more competition than probably people recognize today. So I think the forms of competition in this dynamic sector is definitely an analytical challenge. Um, I'm biased because I was a part of the process, but the DOJ did file comments in the broadband plan where we tried to grapple with this. And um, you know, for those who haven't looked at it, I would suggest that might be one place to look at. The other dynamic you've articulated, um, which is not just the different types of competition among different providers and how to think about that, but how do <coughs> complements interact across a value chain? And that is a very interesting dynamic. Um, there is a creative tension, some people call it co-opetition that exists in that space. And um, I like that phrase, that APIs are the new IP. So um, one question that gets talked about here, and you've adverted to it, is how do we think about and see the opening up of APIs? Um, because I think there's a you know sense within industry, and, and, and Verizon, you've talked about it, is um, hey, we want these applications on our network. That makes our network more valuable. And um, that is a traditional competition policy concern um, about the openness of the network. Uh, to the extent there are competitive pressures that uh, can catalyze that, that's much better than having to have any regulatory or antitrust oversight. And one of the challenges we have, um, and all countries have, is to ensure a vibrant and competitive ecosystem. Um, that is absolutely the first best strategy to driving investment, innovation, and benefits to consumers. Um, we've been very fortunate in this country. There was um, some very uh, far-sighted decisions made in the 90s to have spectrum auctions, get more spectrum out there. Um, there are a lot of countries in the world right now that you know still may have two providers only, and that doesn't have the same competitive dynamics. So um, I think one of the things we have to appreciate, this is one of the things that our filing made, is getting more spectrum out there enables competition to survive. The first best strategy is having enough spectrum so that all providers can have their spectrum demands met. Um, you're in a much worse world if you have to start worrying about you know, firms saying, I can't survive because I don't have spectrum. Um, to the extent we don't plan to get more spectrum out there and find ourselves in that situation down the world, shame on us for having sacrificed part of the competition we have today. If not, let me. I like to throw curveballs. So, um, we're talking about the, the technological and regulatory foundations for mobile broadband, but we have a, a unique situation, I think, with the internet in that the, the internet itself is a framework that is not governed or controlled just by the United States. You have ICANN. And since ICANN is sort of this brave new world still with the folks deciding the architecture of the internet, how it works. As you talk about the, the technology that we're sort of building on top of this framework, is there the potential for impediments to be thrown up by um, non non industrialized advanced mobile broadband economies because they feel like they're going to be further divisions between the haves and have nots? There is always that potential, but I actually am I'm, I'm not such an optimist by nature, but on these issues I'm very optimistic, and I, I really look at it the other way, which is that mobile broadband is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, it is taking off everywhere, and it has such a power to flatten the world, uh, to use Tom Friedman's phrase, and I think that um, 
That's why India just had their 3G auctions and, and we were participating in, the, in their 4G auction. That's why um, you see 3G rolling out worldwide. I know Dr. Jacobs will talk more about that later today. Uh, but I, I really don't see it as impediments worldwide. I see it as more uh, really tremendous, tremendously positive globalization. Great. Um, well, let me, I'm going to ask each, each of the panels maybe to wrap up, maybe with 60 seconds, if you have any last comments you want to make before we sort of segue into our lunch uh, presentations. Um, Bill, you want to start? So one challenge I would put out there to all of you being um, sort of aficionados and experts in this is uh, to help us as a polity make the case for freeing up wireless spectrum using spectrum more efficiently and spurring innovation in this sector. I would agree with sort of Senator Warner on the opportunities here. I think it was important to say that this is an area that we as a country have a national imperative. But I also would caution all of us that this issue outside of the cognoscente here actually gets harder to explain because uh, people take this for granted. And part of the challenge we have is getting beyond that taking this for granted to make the case that this is critical to our competitiveness. Now, one of the benefits of the public safety issue is because of the power of 9-11 and people getting the devices that first responders have, that gives some salience to the issue, but that's really the tip of a larger iceberg and ecosystem that we all need to try to grasp. And so one challenge we all have in the work that Rob doing here is fantastic is to make the case of why this is so important. Um, for all of you who have ideas on that and want to help um, sort of me understand where there are opportunities to push our spectrum initiative forward, and we welcome you on any part of the agenda we've outlined. It's um, something I personally deep, deeply believe in and, and look forward to any of your thoughts and engagement. A, a lesson we've learned from, um, I think, all infrastructure industries is that facilities-based competition is what uh, creates new products and lowers prices. And we've seen that particularly in the, uh, in the wireless world uh, in the mid-90s with the introduction of PCS spectrum since then. And moving forward with uh, getting more spectrum out there will solve a lot of the problems that we were talking about by allowing more competitiveness in the marketplace. Um, so I'd like to keep us focused on that goal. I would agree on the spectrum issues, and, and particularly with Bill's comments, I think we can all identify that the need is out there, and I think we can all identify the candidates, although as Senator Warner said, we'd certainly like some more information about how all licensees are using, uh, particularly the government licensees are using their spectrum. Uh, but there is an enormous challenge ahead of us in terms of identifying the mechanisms by which we get there. And there is no easy answers. When you look at all the spectrum that's been potentially identified for reallocation for the commercial mobile industry, it is all, it's all allocated today. There's incumbent licensees, and I certainly respect the fact that incumbent licensees are not going to give up on the spectrum easily. So it's gonna require, from our perspective, we think it's gonna require a, a very uh, rich dialogue uh, with the puts and takes, and ultimately, I, I'm an optimist too. I agree with Senator Warner that there is an opportunity for a grand bargain here. But getting there, we don't think is going to be easy, and we do think that we all need to be pushing it forward uh, as quickly and as seriously as we can to try to start finding resolutions. I agree solving the spectrum crisis won't be easy, but we can do it. And the reason that I know we can do it is that we have done it. All the policies that Phil is talking about are, are things that have been done in the United States before with tremendous success. Congress mandated that the government spectrum be reallocated and auctioned by the FCC for PCS. That happened. Uh, the government continues to function, their radio operations are unabated, the spectrum was auctioned, and we have uh, 2G wireless rolled out if government makes uh, over $10 billion and 2G wireless systems roll out. Uh, Congress passes a law in the Balanced Budget Act and says that 700 megahertz spectrum should be auctioned, that we're gonna have a digital tra uh, television transition. Uh, they set a date for that transition, they establish a coupon program, uh, the government has the auction. It raises $19 billion, the most successful auction in, in I think, world history. And, um, and uh, auction 73. And lo and behold, we had a date for the DTV transition. People are extraordinarily concerned about it. The date's pushed back by a few months. The transition occurs. 
And here we are, no one's talking about the DPD transition. Did, did it even happen? It, it, it was such a tremendous success. So we, you know, we can do it. It takes national commitment. It, uh, it takes uh, leadership. Thank you, Phil. Thank you to the folks at the FCC. Thank you to a bipartisan consensus in Congress. And it can all happen. Great. So I want to um, first thank Phil and all his hard work and leadership uh, on helping to drive these issues, which are which are really critical to our, our nation and continued prosperity. So thank you, Phil. And then also, if you can join me in thanking all four great panelists.